This is Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. I'm also an author. In 1979, I became a near-death experiencer. I chose to explain the truth I learned about the afterlife, reincarnation, and near-death experience through my fictional book series, The Near Death Saga. While dead, I was shown all human beings are shrouded in ignorance by design in order to learn valuable lessons in each incarnation. When you die, the artificial facade falls away and we awaken from the dream into reality. For more information, you can find us at neardeathtv.com. Please join us as we explore the after effects of near-death experience. Hi, and welcome to Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Kethledge. I'm also an author and a near-death experiencer. Today we have a wonderful guest, my dear friend, Robert Tremblay. Uh, Mr. Tremblay is also the author from the international best-selling book called 20 Seconds. Hi, how are you doing today, Robert? Doing great, Laura, how about yourself? Very good, lots of rain here in Kentucky. Um, oh. I think you have such a unique uh, story, and this is your first book, you're a first-time author. Can you take us back chronologically to the beginning, to the pre-book time, to the catalyst that took you into a near-death experience, please? Yeah, I suppose I guess a lot of that would come back to uh, yeah, February 16th, 2011. Um, or even really prior to, I had been uh, an executive uh, leader in the automobile finance industry for many years, a, a nationwide instructor. So I traveled quite a bit and, and basically fixed people's finance departments and, and auto dealerships and as a contract kind of hitman. And so I was going 100 miles an hour with my hair on fire all the time, of course. And uh, career, 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 and, you know, 16 hour days kind of deal for many, many years. Um, I had come out of uh, the army and, and then law enforcement where I was a, actually a chief of police at a very young age. Um, so I was always kind of go, go, go all the time. Um, but uh, on February 16th of 2011, uh, after experiencing a couple of years of depleting health, um, my career interrupted suddenly, uh, even to the point of unemployment, I found myself in an emergency room in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was living at the time, who uh, a poor young resident doctor in the emergency room had to tell me I was so ill because I was dying of end stage AIDS. Mm -hmm. Just out of the blue, never even considered it, never got tested, never even on my radar list. So I guess that probably spiraled everything from there. Oh, of course. And you were a man, a career man, a man in a hurry, living life to its fullest with all this economic success, social status, and the humbling experience of the diagnosis. You must have been shocked. Oh, just blew me away. I mean, I was, I was married at the time for 10 years. I, I, Fortunately and unfortunately, not a very happy marriage. Um, but uh, you know, we stayed together mostly for her kids, and and uh, so it took us both just right off our feet. And uh, you know, by then I was so ill that um, I had lost my job a couple months earlier, first time in my life, by the way. And it just was, I was so weak and tired that they sent me home to die, and and uh, gave me about six weeks to live, and. Uh, told me about some trials, of course, that I never qualified for because I was just too ill. And they sent me home to die. And, uh, you know, my wife couldn't take it and ended up uh, calling my family saying, come get him. I can't, I can't watch this. And uh, so they came and got me and took me to Vermont. My brother and my half sister drove me all the way from North Carolina to Vermont, not knowing if I'd even survive the trip and uh, oh my put me in the hospital. And I was basically in and out of a coma by then, and uh, you know there was no help. And now I had a pre-existing condition before that was even, an, you know, okay. And uh, 
So somewhere in between the time of my illness and all those things, <laughs> and the irony is Obamacare passes and uh, suddenly my Medicare gets approved while I'm just about in a coma and bang, I have this experience in my hospital bed right there of what I can only assume was about a 20 second real moment of time that for me was an experience that changed everything about me. And, you know, I just, you know, the near death experience was not on my radar list. It's not, um, I, I mean, I've seen enough deaths in my life as a police officer and a combat medic and throughout my, throughout my life, uh, you know, I've seen enough death for three lifetimes. So can you know, you death tell was us, just something. Can, that is just amazing. Can you tell us, Step by step, take us into your near death experience. What was the date, Robert? I'm trying to remember the exact date. I guess it would have been three weeks after I was diagnosed. Uh, by the time I made it back to Vermont and was in the intensive care there. So you're late um, I mean, in I, intensive care. This is, you know, the the last stop of your life. You believe. Yeah. You're in intensive yeah. care with end stage AIDS, and then what happened? Well, you know, I, I mean, I had signed a DNR at that point. Do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. I had no medical insurance. Obviously, I now had a pre-existing condition, even if I could get one. So you're that pretty much decided you were going to die, even if you got medical insurance. Um, the medication's way too expensive. I was diagnosed so late in the system that, you know, it becomes a lifelong lesson and message of my story is, had I been tested earlier, people can live a very normal existence with HIV today. Yes. You know, if you're caught with with one foot on the gray in the grave and one on a banana peel with end stage AIDS, as I was, uh, you know, shame on me, but let it be a lesson for us all. But you know, laying there in that bed, it would take me almost two years to the day to realize the experience I'm about to tell you about wasn't a dream, that it was an actual near-death experience. I just didn't know anything about these things. Well, of course. Uh, I mean, who does? And, and, you know, you're just godsmacked, you know, when you have a catastrophic accident or you actually died. I mean, everybody knew something happened. You you can't, based off of what how I reacted afterwards, and and we'll get into that. But it, um, you know, for me, I woke up out of this event and literally walked out of bed, which I supposedly couldn't have walked. Walked down to the nurses' station, demanded to see all of my doctors because there was something important I was supposed to do. Why people stared at me going. Isn't that the guy who was just in a coma down the hallway? What the hell is going on? So, I mean, it was instantaneous changes in me. Um, and then, you know, my healing begins. But, you know, there's a part of the whole story that still troubles people if they can see the forest through the trees. It isn't that people don't have miraculous recoveries after these crazy experiences. I call them crazy because it's just been crazy my story bothers people because you can't blame it on my immune system like many doctors do. You know, we, we constantly hear these near death experience stories and people go, boy, you know, those doctors go, boy, we just don't know the immune system. It's, it's amazing what it can actually do. I mean, we, the fact we can heal a cut just shows you the infinite power of our bodies. I mean, every day. And it's, if you look at it on a grander style, if you're in the right environment, the right mindset, you can heal almost anything in your body, but it requires a discipline to do it. And, you know, some of that is with things I discovered that I wouldn't have had to discover unless pushed right to the edge. So my gosh, and the, edge, my the edge is really, is really where I was, you know, even the analogy of my experience, I, I wasn't dreaming back then. I was so sick in and out of a coma. Oh, I don't yeah. remember dreaming but this experience happened and this is when I woke up walked down the hall and said I have to see my doctors was I I thought I was dreaming about a huge vast black expanse there was a humming noise even a breeze I could even taste something in the air 
I knew it was endless. I should have been a little nervous, but I was at great peace, almost jokingly. And off in the distance was this red curved arc of light, almost like a translucent ribbon of light that looked like a circle, almost like from a distance. It, I thought, honestly, Laura, it was the edge of a volcano. Oh, my. And I thought... <laughs> And I thought, you know, I actually giggled thinking this is it. This is I this is where people with HIV and AIDS go. That you know, this is you get thrown into a volcano. So it I literally began traveling to this red lit ribbon of light. Um or they traveled to me. I don't know. I couldn't feel that. It was a different ethereal feel of your body, I guess. I don't have trouble explaining it all, but it was weightless. I didn't even know I was standing on anything. You know, it was all black except that one ribbon of light that I was traveling to. And then almost instantly, I was standing on the edge of this ribbon of light, and you know, expecting it to be a volcano. And of course, there was nothing in there. It was just more blackness. And... I could still see how the light curved like the edge of a volcano, but it, there was no lava or brimstone. So I, I even remember giggling and and thinking, you know, this is a dividing line. You know, this line I'm standing on, this red translucent ribbon of light, it has meaning. I could not see its ending. I could not see where it met. I just knew it was... This was the line of something. A threshold, a threshold of sorts. For sure. That, that's a great, great verb uh, or a great analogy. I'm sorry. Uh, there was just something definitive about it. And I remember the vibration increasing, the odor, even that breeze mm -hmm. on my face. And um, uh, just a curiosity, I guess. And, uh, off what would have been, you know, the bottom of the pit, I guess, if you could see that. It wasn't one, it just was black, but there was a small sliver of white light and like a star, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I sewed in the vibration and the breeze and even the odor and taste, and I could taste something in my mouth. And, and my teeth were vibrating, and this light got bigger until it was basically all in front of me, and it was had movement, pure white with bluish streaks that showed definitive movement uh, to what appeared to be almost a circle in the middle that almost became kind of donuty shaped. And it was noisy and crackling and breezy. And it was just so weird, you know, honestly. I so just, many senses and height heightened that you have. Yeah. What, I'm, was, what I'm hearing is, I'm not hearing fear. I'm not hearing fear. No, anymore. total curiosity. Of, wow. You know what I always, it came to me sometime later, the whole blackness and expanse. And you know what it reeked of? What? It came to me years later, potential raw slated potential of whatever you wanted it to be yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why I think that it's just an intuitive you know thing that's something I've gained thinking about that very moment because it's obviously become a pivotal moment of my life and uh, you know this light gets bigger and bigger and the center hole is a darker and all of a sudden of course this is stereotypic and this is what drives you crazy is for me at the time was the center of that light started forming like a face. Those, uh -huh. those blue streaks became highlights of a weathered old man. And his hair, you know, longer hair down to his shoulders, very weathered face, very familiar. And it took over the entire light. And I remember just giggling, thinking, this is god i mean this is what i was taught as a child i suppose not necessarily like this but this is a face that i feel like is important and it, i mean it was you know an all oh, holy shit moment mm -hmm. um, i remember wanting to touch it you know but it seemed too far away and uh and, and then there was like a smile on his face and then and then as i always say there were words and his lips didn't move, but the sound was in every 
hair on my body. I could feel it vibrate was him saying, are you ready? And it wasn't anything specific, but I knew exactly what he meant. I mean, I felt like I was standing before the face of God. And, you know, I to think back in the real world, back in my hospital bed, I had signed a do not resuscitate. I had given up. Mm-hmm. I had gone home to die with my family and and felt at peace in giving up. And a good portion of it was the shame of my diagnosis. That how could I have gotten HIV? I wasn't gay. I wasn't drug user. I tried to live a decent life. Um, I just, you know, career and women were my, were my curses of, of focus. And here I am standing in front of this face saying, are you ready? And I just, I blurted out, no, I'm not. And uh, that face smiled so wide. And he, uh, the last words were, there's something important you're supposed to do. And just like that, his face, a smile got so wide, it started splintering and rays of light beamed on, you know, kind of like how the sun comes out of a cloud. And so bright, the vibration got so loud, I thought my teeth would fall out. And the irony was, I actually remember peeing my pants. And I reached out and I put my hand on that light and the explosion of vibration and this timeless encapsulation of me where I felt like I was seeing heaven and green fields below and rivers and streams and mountains and beauty. And and then what seemed like his face transforming into so many different faces. It seemed to go on forever. Do you recognize any of the faces, someone you knew? No. I mean, it just was so fast of a flip. You know, and I used to call it, I don't know if you remember that Michael Jackson video one time where he had all those faces that transmuted into the next, you know, race, person, color of person, and and it just all melds together. It was just kind of like that. I just, I know it sounds stupid, but it's a good way to describe how the faces transformed just in what seemed like billions. And I I often still wonder, who were those people? Were they people that I had affected and never knew, you know, as a medic, were they people I had saved as a cop, were they people's lives I had touched or saved or arrested even, I mean, who, how, and, you know, I still don't have those answers, of course, I, I don't have many answers about my near-death experience, Laura, unlike many near-death experiencers who suddenly seem to be experts at it, I, I feel maybe even more naive about you know about things than asked and before uh, you know I, I i i do know that you know there's something important i'm supposed to do was the carrot that you know made me wake up and uh, the next thing i remember was floating backwards and then waking up in that hospital bed and literally even covered in urine, whipping my blankets off and saying, I got to get something done and I need to see my doctors. They all came in looking at me like I had lost my freaking mind. I, you know, I didn't tell them about the whole thing. I just said, there's something important I'm supposed to do. What do I need to do to save my life? And, you know, they all just said, holy shit, we don't even know if it's possible, but this is what we can do. There were 12 of them. And I laugh about that. So, you know, my apostles, I call them. And, just help me, tell me what to do and I'll do the rest. And uh, so we started medical treatment that would go on. And, you know, we're eight years later and I'm still suffering. But the the suffering is the irony of the story because it's what makes the story so miraculous and so upsetting to the medical industry is that at the time I was diagnosed, even the time I spent in hospice, I had little to no functioning immune system. So you can't blame it on the immune system anymore. My story is different, but you've got to get through the, you know, the ugly stigma that's been around with that disease for a long time. And one of the things that I became very passionate about trying to make a difference in. Yes. Can you please tell us what your, what your passion is? Well, I mean, when I started with the book, I, I started charity at the same time. 
Um, and one of the goals was, it was called Give a Buck, Gab for short. And his goal was uh, I'd donate a dollar from the proceeds of every book if people would donate a dollar of their own. And it was really a grassroots movement of, you know, it's not all what you do, it's that you do something to get involved. And with a collective collaborative, I felt like I could do something to change the impact or future of the disease. And, you know, eventually I got uh, approached about the screenplay and the movie for the book, and we're still in negotiations. Um, so that was hefty. And then, you know, a year after I wrote the book about my story, it became an international bestseller on Amazon, and it stayed there ever since. So it's been over three it's years. Audible, you know, you've got the paperback, the hardback, you've got the Audible, the Kindle. I mean, it, it's in very different format for the uh, pleasure of the the reader. Um, Robert, it is, I think one of the things that is very important is how a heterosexual man's man, because you know, you were a cop and everything, you know, could come out and talk about it and explain that HIV, AIDS is everyone's disease, everyone's concern. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, HIV and AIDS was categorized as a gay disease back in the 70s and 80s, and that was its, that was its orientation originally. Now, quite obviously, anybody who understands the disease understands that that's not the only, you know, population that anybody can be affected. And, but we just don't talk about the other people other than the gay people because, and I have nothing against the trans gay population. It's just the disease got taken by that community. They had them get the rights they should have gotten years ago and good for them. But it does not leave, you will not find many advocates who are not openly gay. And I, it befuddles me considering when the population understands this fact, and I think you better play it three or four times on your airline. 51% of the population currently infected with HIV worldwide are females ages 13 to 24 years of age. Yes, I've read that. It's, it's just I mean, heartbreaking. <laughs> Say it out loud, 51% are females 13 to 24. These are our, our granddaughters, our daughters, our children. 13 to 24, 51% in the worldwide population. Yes. Come on. You don't need to do the math to understand that giving birth to a child with HIV is a horrible thing. And the least, and the least medically tested people in this world are females. So there's a and, and heterosexual males like me. I would have walked. I would have never walked in in my suit and business tie in my in my Jaguar pulling up at an HIV clinic to get tested. Are you shitting me? Who would do that? No I mean, I'm glad they're there, but, but we think, need to be more honest about it. You think first of all, you can't. You think of the invincibility. Well, I don't do drugs, so it can't happen to me. My partner is heterosexual, sure. so it can't happen to me. It can happen to anybody. Right. And that was obviously the major lesson for me was, you know, at least try to do what you can. And I always misunderstood the, the simple fact that when you go in for a simple blood test today, Laura, they test 55 aspects of your blood. But not one of those 55 things is a communicable disease like hepatitis C or HIV or, or, or a disease you could be unknowingly spreading and killing people and never knowing. So I wonder about that. How's that? Most senators I talked to didn't even know that was about. How's that possible? <laughs> that sounds like that's exactly my point. So we inevitably took this story, the book that came out, uh, you know, five years ago now, and four years ago, and and our platform and the potential movie, and and we started doing some lobbying and. Uh, Good. Really, I say we. It was really me running around the country like an idiot, half dead. And, and but we, you know, I ended up getting some things done, and it was a real pleasure to do it. It's Can you tell me about really the dope. legislative successes, Robert? Yeah, we. I inevitably, after the visit to the U.S. House and Senate, um, visiting over 20 people there and senators, um, I got some ins down in the local to start statewide. So I went back to my home state at the time in Arizona. 
and uh, started lobbying senators and, and House members at the state level. And after about 40 meetings, I got a senator who agreed to sponsor a bill with my platform behind me. And um, we thought we'd need a lot of publicity and blah, 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 and stars and celebrities, but we didn't. Um, the bill passed. The, the, and by the time I had gotten through the Senate, I had talked to everybody on the Health com Commission, so sailed through that committee. <laughs> and then I inevitably lobbied everybody, just myself, just telling my story, giving them a copy of my book, having a good cry with them, talking about moments of impact in our lives and what we do with them. So, I mean, it was just exhausting and beautiful and magnificent. And uh, anyway, they passed the bill and it signed uh, last year. <laughs> and here was the bill. It, it basically, um, it's not mandated testing in the state of Arizona, but if you walk into Arizona to get a sports physical or you break your ankle, I don't care your age, your sex, your habits, they don't either, but you will be at do you want a free HIV test? And you will hear it every doctor's visit, every emergency visit, even dental visits, until you get sick of hearing it to the point where there no longer becomes a stigma with it. And eventually you just realize it needs to be a routine test, like the CDC says every year if you're sexually active. That is just wonderful. And that is going to save lives. And we're so grateful that you did it. I, I think it's a, a, it's a wonderful thing. You know, um, because of my own personal illness, I had multiple tests, thank God, all negative. But, you know, it, it could, it's just a good thing to know and to be aware of your health. It's just essential these days. Well, it, you know, the, the, the hidden stories behind this is part of the sequels of the next book. You, the stories of me traveling around the country and, and the, the, you know, some of the close calls I took in my health and meeting all these people, but, and even some of the dirty details of, of you know, they always say, hey, Laura, there's two things you don't want to see that made in life. And that's sausages and laws. Yeah, and exactly. I, I found out very quickly the dirty politics behind that because my original submission of bill included hepatitis C. Um, in in it routine tests, help Hep C. Yeah. Well, and that's the funny part. That's a great funny story in my new book because the state of Arizona inevitably removed hepatitis C because they did a study and found out it would, it would literally be too expensive to cure people and save lives. Um, Robert, can you tell that, us what your new book is going to be called? It's called Dying for Forgiveness. When is it going to be released? Uh, it should be this spring. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's basically written. I just, I need to honestly find the courage to publish it. I've, I've struggled terribly with, with illness after illness. And, you know, we, we still wrestle with the idea on a weekly basis that uh, we still don't have the immune system like most people and uh, something could come along and finish us. And uh, so I need to, you know, be leery of my health, and uh, I've really, really just been focusing on that for the last year. Yeah, take care of your health, but I see this book being uh, a, a second wave of information, and I'd like to have you back on Near Death TV after it's been released. Robert, um, you know, I think what a lot of the listeners would like to find out, I truly believe, because it happened to me after my near-death experience, you have so-called psychic or insights or you're more sensitive towards, quote, the paranormal or other uh, non-physical realities. Could you tell me uh, what have you experienced after your near death at the hospital? Oh, my. I, I, I think probably one of the more significant, because I, I was never a believer in any of this. You know, I, I've had friends who you know, believed in, in these things, the afterlife, even even holistic medicine, I used to pick on them and call it witchcraft. So yeah. that gives you an idea of what kind of moron I used to be with with the commercial world of, of existence. So stepping out of the box for me, all of a sudden, everything stepped out of the box. What you was know, your uh, most significant experiences? I, well, synchronicity uh, everywhere, a hundred times a day. And, you know, at first... I couldn't handle it. I had 
I also had issues with people. And, you know, I was an extrovert all my life. I was a leader of people, hundreds of people. And, and so suddenly to find myself uh, feeling and seeing things from people, I was like, what the hell is going on? Well, so that, I literally, what did you see or feel? Did you see auras? Did you feel negativity when you met somebody or were you overwhelmed with a connection, a familiarity with them? Well, I found out that it was human touch at first, right after my near-death experience. I, oh, excuse me for one second. That's okay. Um, you know what I think that is so phenomenal yeah. with uh, so many people being more resuscitated today, uh, surviving these catastrophic illnesses, there's been more documented near-death experiences now than ever in uh, human history. So I think the common thread to all these people is the fact that when you come back, I think the door is a little bit open, still open to the other side and people seem to have more insights, more psychic abilities, uh, you know, things like that. I find it very, very I, interesting. I think you're a hundred percent right. And I, you know, one of the common denominators of my experience, and, and I, I smell it in many others, although I don't read a lot of other experiences, I never have been able to. I, I feel bad about that. But anyway, is it, the common denominator seems to be that we come back and, and change, not just there's so many changes, which I wrote about in, in my book, some of the research that's been done on it is hard to ignore. But I think it's greater than that. And, and I think, you know, one of the common denominators for me was was fully grasping the aspect, Laura, of my life that before my near-death experience, mm -hmm. I might have been completely batshit fucking crazy. I, I mean, I was wrong about almost everything about life, about healing, about medicine, about, uh, about religion, about faith, about my body, my magnificence, my light, and the importance of it in our world, the... I understood my long-term sports connection in, in, in positive mind belief and thinking and how that it wasn't just a, a slogan for an athletic sports slogan. It, it was down to a cellular level. So a lot of things after my near-death experiences revolved around holy cow moments of epiphany that I felt like I truly didn't even know what to do with. And they were a hundred times a day. You know, these holy cow, you know, this is how you do this. And what about that? And what is this organ of the body? Things I have no business even considering, let alone focusing on. Well, I believe, so, Robert, you, know, that you had a shift. I think near-death experiences, when they return, they have a shift. And the, first of all, your core beliefs are turned upside down. That's pretty much a shocker, a given. But secondly... There's like an open door. You perceive more, you understand more, and you certainly have more questions because there's no guidebook and no how-to uh, near-death experience for dummies out there. So right. I, I know that you told me earlier that you went to a place where there was a missing person and you were able to locate the person who had already passed. Can you tell us about that journey, about that, about that experience? I'm not sure. Oh, you're, um, I guess you're referring, it was uh, right after I got off the road from meeting with senators, I had traveled back to Arizona. And I have to tell you, I didn't know if I'd make the drive from Washington, D.C. to Arizona. Oh, gracious. I was that sick. And and this was after 38 days on the road where I traveled from Arizona uh, through the Midwest into Vermont and did multiple talks in the park. It ended in Washington, D.C., and then I drove back to Arizona. So by the time I got back, I was half dead. It was bad. Um, I met a friend at a, at a cabin, and we went out uh, rock hunting the next day before we headed, you know, the final half an hour to home. And... Um, Ended up getting caught in a storm at a watering hole. We walked up the mountain and got out of it. 
Um, inevitably, that an hour later, we heard that that water hole got hit by a flood waters, you know, Arizona mountains. Flash floods are common there. It, it, it washed away 10 family members, including oh. five kids. Um, only one child had survived, and it was just horrific. So, and of course, we were there, and I was troubled by it, and I was probably vibrating pretty good, surviving what I'd just done, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. feeling like I had escaped that. I uh, ended up going home the next day, and I couldn't sleep. And they started finding all the bodies, and uh, suddenly they couldn't find the father, the main guy. And it, and uh, so the next day I couldn't still couldn't sleep and I literally got up at three in the morning got in my car and drove back to the mountains. Um, I had no idea what to do but I knew I needed to go and I'm not usually I fight the psychic things a lot Laura to be honest and this was so moving for me and I, I remember the drive back thinking I kept thinking about sunflowers and cell phones I just kept having these visions and it was peaceful and I didn't know what I was doing but I knew this giant search party of volunteer firefighters and and you know the forest rangers were working day and night tirelessly to try to find him and storms were coming in and out still and they had found all nine of the ten family members all dead I mean imagine the suffering yeah imagine the suffering so I pull up at the first, you know, roadblock and I walk right up to the leader and I say I'm a former police officer I'm also a near-death experience and a, and a combat medic, and I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm supposed to be here, and I think it's important to, you put me to, to work and whatever I can do. And he let me through to the next roadblock. I got to the next roadblock, said the same thing to the guy. I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm supposed to be here. I told them, and I never do this. I'm a near-death experiencer. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm supposed to be here. He let me through that, that roadblock. So I get up to the main staging area, and I'm walking around by myself in civilian clothes, and all these cars are parked, and this family pours out all sweaty from the from the river banks, and it's the family of the guy, the, what's left of the family oh of the guy. God. And they had been searching all night, and I literally gather them up, and I tell them the same story. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Um, one of them is, was the guy's father, his grandfather, the kid's grandfather's. Uh, so they all hugged me and we sat together and the firemen came out and said, no, nobody in the woods anymore. So I promised them I'd keep the family together. And we talked and we sat and the firemen, you know, were searching all over the, the riverbanks and helicopters and drones and everything else and dogs. And I told them about my near death experience. And um, anyway, we just had uh, an afternoon where I sat holding hands and just hanging out, making sure they didn't go in the woods again. And so anyway, in the afternoon, long story short, one of the guy, one of the family members said, can you bring me down to get our car? So I drove him down the river to get his car and I pulled into the place. He said, my car is here. Um, and it was sunflower court. And I, and I just thought, sunflower, son of a bitch. And so I bring him down. I get, let him out of his car, and I pull back to go back to the staging area. I look up on the side of the mountain, which is right by the bridge where the river runs under, and oh. really low in the search area. They weren't even really searching there. They weren't searching there, maybe one. Uh, but anyway, I look up on the mountain as I'm pulling out to the main road to cross the bridge, and there's this giant sunflower on the mountainside that had no business being there. Not a sunflower in sight, but this eight-foot sunflower poking out into the sunlight. And you had really pulled over. images be hours before that would take you there. You were being told yeah. where to go. Yep. Yep. Really? I, I was shaking and crying so much. I pulled over right by the bridge. I walked under the bridge to the river, and all of a sudden there were butterflies everywhere. And they were fluttering around me, and I was crying, and I was shaking. And they literally started floating down the river. It was, of course, it was a mess after the flood. So I'm yeah. staggering, staggering like a moron child, following these butterflies, crying like a baby. I have no idea why. So emotional. I mean, it was. I was shaking, and so I get down a hundred yards, and and all of a sudden I look. And there's a dog with a safety vest on standing in the middle of the river. 
and it sees me from a hundred yards away mm-hmm. and it literally bolts right up the river at me and it, it's such joy and it's you know bounding through the river i'm smiling now crying i end up collapsing down sitting down on my butt and this dog is a search dog and it literally crawls up the bank to get to literally lay in my lap and roll around on my lap soaking wet like a i've never seen an animal do that and i have a freakish thing with animals but that was weird so the instructor or the search dog uh, handler came out of the woods and was like, what the hell what are you doing here? And why is my dog doing that? And of course I'm bawling. So I start telling my story. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm a near blah, 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 blah. And, and he's like, you know, the dog was reacting up here. Tell me what you're seeing or feeling. And I said, we're standing right here. He's here. This man is here. The dog knows it. I know it. It's, he's still underwater. He needs to get pushed around a little bit more by more water, maybe. But I can taste sand. And all of a sudden, the, in the instructor, the guide dog guy is on the other side of the river, and we're talking and we're having this emotional experience. Why the dog is literally falling asleep in my lap? And I said, "We've already. The dog's already done its job. It just needs to do its thing." And he looked down at his feet and he goes, oh, my God. And he said, I just found a cell phone. It was the husband's cell phone. It was the last last thing he had in his hand. Um, So anyway, I uh, agreed to get out of there. I I said, I'm I'm done here. I just had the satisfaction of I'm done here. We hadn't found his body, but I knew it was right there. And it was well with that out of the range of the normal, you know, 20 man search crew. Well, you you, so. you gave closure to that family. It was important that they be able to bury their, their. Well, I, I wasn't sure, you know, and I, I, but I knew I was done. Mm-hmm. So I literally staggered back up the hill to my car. I got in my car and went to the staging area and the family was gone. So I was like, perfect. Quietly. Um, as I pulled back in, the fire chief had already been radioed from the search crew, this crazy near-death guy's in the woods, and we found his cell phone and a piece of his shirt now. So by the time I got to the staging area, so the chief pulled me out and said, look, you got to stay out of the woods, but between me and you and the wall, what are you seeing? And I told him everything. I said, he's right there. You've already done your work. It just needs to be moved around. The water's got to come down or get pushed around more. And uh, I said, there's a storm coming and you're not going to get it done today, uh, but you've already found it. And uh, I said, I'm done here. I'm going to go. And I was crying and he thanked me. And I don't think he even knew my name. Um, Of course, all the firemen had been hearing the radios about what, you know, that I had found the cell phone and the dog's reaction. They, you know, it just became an urban legend. So I got into my car and um, the chief said, look, there's no rain coming. We've got spotters with the forest service. I said, look, you're going to get bad rain, get them out of the woods. He's like, yeah, okay. And literally as I pulled out of the driveway, it started pouring. And I looked back through my rear view mirror and the chief raised his hands, um, got his guys and they all started pouring out of the woods to be safe. And then uh, they found his body the next morning in the exact spot. Oh my gosh. Robert, you were there to help. You got visual pictures, which I'm familiar with. And you did a good thing. This family needed that closure. They may never have found him if you hadn't intervened. No, no. And that would have been I always wondered. And I think that spending the time with them during the day, you know, while they were in such distress and Here's this poor, crazy guy who died once and had a beautiful experience. I just don't think anything bad comes of that. So, you know, maybe that was the real gift of it, not just, you know, following butterflies and, and, and feeling the energy of a dog. But, uh, you know, I knew I had done what I needed to do and I could go home and sleep, but I hadn't slept like almost three days by then. So I literally the, the went gift, home. The gift you received, you received psychic abilities. You returned with psychic insights and abilities. Now there's not exact, uh, uh, you know, directions with them. You know, some of the messages come in sideways, but you've been gifted 
these things for a reason. I think it's been so important that you write this book and you, you do the follow-up book and just the blood work testing that, you know, the law was changed, the bill was changed, could save lives. There's nothing more meaningful than helping other people or nothing more important than being able to show your love for others doing such things. And I'm, I tell you, my hat's off to you, Robert. Well, if you, you know, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. And it, uh, Very much. I wish, I wish my body could do more. I do yeah. every day. Like you, I wrestle with the limitations and I try to find peace with them, but it still remains my, you know, the discipline that I, I still need to work on. <laughs> is is take it as it comes and and uh, don't get so mad at your body it's been through hell and, and it's done good things and touched a lot of lives and uh, i'm happy for that i think also you know finding humor in life and loving animals you know it's such a positive thing i mean i listen i'm the gal that had the horse instead of a husband <laughs> for 25 years you know, there's something to be said though I, you know, <laughs> I, if, it's, if there's any gift, I call a gift since my near-death experience, it has been my connection with animals. I mean, the, just the intense things that happen with animals now with me have been remarkable experiences okay. and very fulfilling, and, and more so than human beings, I do have to agree. <laughs> now, I remember, you know, you were so kind to talk to me, you know, after my father passed away a few years back, and I thank you for that. But I remember something you mentioned during that conversation about your near-death experience connecting to your grandfather. Could you uh, talk to us about that? Yeah, you know, I I had talked about my experience in intensive care with a few people mm -hmm. and told them about it. And I had always talked about it in the sense that it was a dream, a very vivid, real, holy cow dream, but a dream nonetheless. Um, and it was almost exactly two years later, or Christmas time, that it would come to fruition, something from my experience that would jar me into the realization it wasn't a dream. Obviously, over those two years, a lot of things happened to me, as I outlined in the book. I had gone into hospice. I survived hospice. Um, I had multiple cancer diagnoses. I survived those, all still keeping in mind I had barely an immune system. So we all knew I had changed. My personality had changed. I had become childlike, different, psychic, scared of it to death. But anyway, two years later at Christmas time, we get the family calendar with all the pictures on it. And there's this only old picture happens to be a grainy old black and white picture of an older man that ended up being this exact same face that was in the light of my, what I called a dream. And that man's face was my grandfather on my father's side who had died many years before I was born. No, I, I never that. knew him. He, he was much older, much older. My dad was much older than my mom. So my grandfather was, you know, dead many years. And there weren't pictures or, you know, family gatherings. So, I may he have loved you, Robert. He loved you there. You know, he loved you. He was there for you. I think that's so that amazing. was yeah. For two years, I thought I had touched the face of God. Mm -hmm. The reality was, it turns out to be your grandfather who died years before you were even born. So you you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to Google all what's happened to you and find out that you know there are. 20 or 30 million people who've had experiences like mine, and it's probably time to pay attention to them. They're studied pretty good now. Mm -hmm. I wrote a lot about it because I didn't know. And, and I, you know, I think a lot of us are in a big hurry for career. We don't, we don't read a book unless it's going to make us money or be good for our career. A lot of it, we don't have time. So, you know, a lot of my time I spend educating myself and trying to have my own experience in doing it, I guess. And I, I think, you know, some of it, the life's secret is, is new experiences are everything. I think that's the whole point of evolution and how you evolve. Yeah. And the unfortunate part is sometimes you have to admit you were crazy wrong and be okay with it because that's, you know, sometimes experiencing new things turns out that you might not have figured out before. And we need to be okay with that. Learning being wrong. I mean, I'm I'm wrong more than I'm right. But 
I even find humor in it, don't you? Well, I do considering how hard we were, you know, in our younger years when we made a mistake. When, when you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you hurt somebody, you make amends and, you know, all the things that you need to do. But I don't think we should have gone through our life convicting ourselves repeatedly for our mistakes when they were brilliant evolutionary moments of true understanding. You didn't teach me shit without engaging an emotion in me as a child. And I don't think I was any different than anybody else. We just don't teach kids the right thing anymore. And we hide our emotions when emotion is what carries it. We, we know these things now. I mean, science is doubling its information every day now with the internet and the connectivity yeah. of this world. And we're still surviving most of us off of high school biology, Laura, until we need to do something different, right? I mean, take exactly. the strike. Exactly. You know, I had my near-death experience in 1979. No internet, no books on it. Uh -huh. I tried to talk to the emergency room doctor. He asked me what drugs I was taking. I went yeah. to the office and she said, are we having a pity party today, Janice, over our broken nose and hand and, you know, your, my injuries because I was a giant bruise from head to toe afterwards. I was really hurt. And I was so shamed that I just withdrew. I didn't talk about it publicly till I was 50, till I had taken all my paranormal experiences and put them in a book. Mine was fiction. Uh, yours is nonfiction, but to get it out, wasn't it cathartic for you? Didn't it feel good to tell everybody, even then the written word, knowing that that's your legacy that you're gonna leave? Doesn't it feel like you made you mark? You know, there was a big, there were multiple moments of me writing that book in, in the, in the world of society and what people think of you and family and my ego prior was that of, you know, success and, and, you know, I, that, that's how I was built. I was, I never lost. So for me to come out with a book, not just talking about a near death experience I had, but Laura, I had to come out and tell the world I had HIV. And you right. know, I lost I lost people by doing it. You know, family, the people that I loved, that, you know, they ran when I got sick. And it's their loss. Did, well, and it's okay. I but I struggled with it still, and I and it's okay to talk about it. I mm -hmm. I don't try to blow it off and pretend it doesn't bother me because I, you know, one of the aspects of my story and my book wasn't that I'm some kind of hero. It was the people I met were. <laughs> if you really read the story carefully, it was always about who I connected with that carried me to the next step when I was half dead mm -hmm. and gave me that little bit of hope that I took like freaking bone marrow and sucked on it. I mean, it was lonely and scary and we need to be okay talking about that. But we also need to be okay in, in not blaming people for running. But let's not let's not not talk about it. I mean, the fact of the matter is when when I was told I was dying, some people ran because they didn't know what to say or to do. And I get it. But it doesn't mean we're not going to talk about it. And I'm not going to be, you know, silent to, 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 to act like it's some kind of raw nerve for me. It should be. Our human connectivity has the power to heal other people. It, does. It, it just depends on what you bring to the table. Now, if you want to run, that's fine. But that's your grief. It, it, that is your grief manifested, period. Now, and, now tell, me, tell me where, uh, what your website is. Tell me about, uh, let's tell the listeners where they can buy the book. Yeah, I mean, I have a YouTube uh, channel with several of my talks. Uh, I, I did a lot of things on the road, um, at conferences and seminars and uh, there's documentaries I've been in, and you can see all those things on, on YouTube. I took my website down because I'm no longer selling my books. It, it never really it pans out or helps to take to dilute away from people buying it on Amazon so they can actually help your numbers. So, so I, if I, I, if I Google in, you know, if I put in 20 seconds of Robert Tremblay, it will go right to oh, your yeah. Amazon page where your book is? It'll go right to Amazon. It'll go right to your top Google page. It's it's everywhere. Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, Amazon is 
still probably 98% of our business is, you know, people just like that ease, I guess. That's fine. The audio books there, the, you know, all, all of that. So you can check out YouTube or check out any of those interviews that I've done on videos or whatever. I'm That's happy wonderful. to do now, that. Um, so 20 seconds is out there. I mean, to every listener, I, this is just a must read book. So your next book will be coming out in the spring. What about the movie? What about the documentary about you? Well, it's, um, I mean, it's going to be, you know, it, it, the problem that we're having is a Chinese movie production company that's, as you may have heard, they've kind of made their move into Hollywood. So yes. there's a lot of arts and there's a lot of communication barriers and there's a lot of things I won't give up. Um, I mean, this is an important story to me that is about human desire and human connection and what we can do as, as unified people. Um, so if there's no charitable aspect or, or ground moving, you know, mechanism that's going to move the needle on something, then I don't want to just have a movie. <laughs> that's you have not... in that movie and you want off, uh, authenticity and you're looking in for integrity and that's, that's admirable and that's the way it should be. I just wanted to do something. You know what I mean? I wanted to move the damn needle. We've sat around and talked about this disease for 35 years and we still ignore it. I get it, but come on. That very ignoring of it is what's making it spread and we can stop it. We functionally have a medical way to stop the spread of the disease. If you are on medication, you cannot spread the disease. Medically, scientifically, it's impossible. The problem is you got 70% of the people with HIV that aren't on the medication. It's money. So, you know, we need to move that needle that it's, you know, it's bigger than just the whole gay disease and there is now a way to stop it. So now it's a matter of opportunity. And, you know, if we can't unify to do it, it ain't going to happen. And I'm so sorry to say it's been the hard part of why I did most of this on my own was you don't find HIV advocates that work together. They're still competing for grant money every day. Yeah. That's not promoting what you want and what you need. They don't want you to be that big. They're yeah. funding you to not be that big. So we've got a lot of work to do to unify yeah. on this. Almighty thing. dollar this comes normal, to play. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, if you can test my cholesterol, can you test my blood to make sure I'm not killing somebody? How about we talk about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I just don't think it's a stretch. Mm -hmm. So... We'll keep hoping and working. You know, Arizona was the first state to come out and do this in the country, you know, just to have this dialogue, this option, this candid conversation without it being shamed or stigmatized. I mean, in some states, they're like, well, are you having intercourse? Or are you, I mean, you don't need to get into that. You just need to be asked, would you like a free test? Period. And I don't care how many times you hear it. Eventually, you'll get Everybody so sick of hearing it. It's not going to be a thing. Everybody gets a blood test, you know, for a blood draw. It should be automatically tested along with your thyroid and your cholesterol. Right. And HIV should be right in there without discussion. Let's say, you they're know, testing, save lives right, they're, they're testing your blood for 55 routine things. You don't want to know why? Because they do want to know where your thyroid is. Why? Because they can prescribe medication for you. Mm -hmm. So they test 55 mm -hmm. things without your okay with the potential of prescribing you medications, but they're not gonna test you for a disease that you could have spread and killed five people, including hepatitis C. I mean, come on, are you kidding me? It's, it's just, so, when, when money in politics and, and the healthcare, it's a terrible toxic mix, the three. But Robert, what yeah. I want to get back to you, this book, the message that you're, you're, you're conveying the psychic experiences that you have are so unique, are so, the theme is so universal with other near-death experiencers. You know, we see the light, the glass is half full because I think, let me ask you this, you know that when you have a disease, any serious disease, you're kind of walking it alone. Because nobody's having it with you. It's not a couple's thing, but um, let me get straight into that, uh, Robert, knowing that there is a continuation after physical death, 
isn't that just like, you know, a lifeline that keeps you going? Because it, it does me. You know, I, I, I think it, it makes me not, you know, life's funny, as you know, with fear. And it, it's, it doesn't seem too impossible to, to grasp the concept of the things that we fear find us. Uh, and sometimes faster than others, uh, but it's almost a biological consequence of, of that fear emotion, and it brings it to you eventually. Um, you know, and I think that's an important lesson about life. So I think it gave me some peace in understanding that it isn't the the crazy, scary, horrific, you know, blackness or demons or hell or fire Fire and brimstone. I mean, I felt great shame in in that moment of my death and why I felt like I was staring at a volcano that had no lava in it and meeting a man who turns out to be my grandfather that I think is the face of God who gives me the carrot of hope that I needed, mm-hmm. which is you're supposed to do something important. So I've chased that ever since. And I felt like it was important. And I, you know, I think everything's important. So I think that was kind of the lesson for, for me. I, you know, I just I just try not to take a position on a lot of this, but one of the things I struggled with at first was the desire to go back. And, and you know, we don't talk about that. And I, I know it's awkward. I'm sure near-death experience would be like, shh, 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 you shouldn't be talking about that. Well, bullshit. I mean, come on. You have this magical experience where you, I mean, come on. It, it's a life-altering. And it was beautiful and peaceful and magical. And I explain it in fine detail in my book. And I think it's important to understand that you don't think for a minute you're going to come back, fight like hell to live through pain and suffering and misery. Why, why the hell didn't I just stay? I mean, it's a valid issue. It's almost a survivor because guilt of issue. Your purpose, I because you have a purpose and it is important and you want to finish something, I'm assuming. Well... I, I think that was the original intent. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to ever think it was one thing because I often wondered if it was just one important thing I was supposed to do, would that mean my life's over? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, my health is on the razor's edge all the time. I, you know, I'm not supposed to be within six feet of another human being. You know, and I'm running around sleeping in my car for a month trying to change the damn laws to try to save people who, you know, to be honest, they didn't even, nobody helped me through the process. My, my charity went bankrupt. There was not one HIV group in the country that agreed to work with me. I mean, it was dumbfounding what I watched and saw and wrote about in the new book about what are we doing? Have we lost our collective minds? Well, that's, I just, that's, uh, that's pretty close, pretty close to reality, but Robert, we're, our hour's kind of over. It's gone over an hour, but I want to thank you for being on Near Death TV. And I think that everybody should go out and buy 20 Seconds by Robert Tremblay. And what are your closing thoughts that you want to say to um, our to our listeners? Well, yeah, this week we've had, uh, yeah, the last couple of months has been so crazy in this world. And you know, the disorganization and the division and everything pulling us apart and separating us. And, and, you know, last week we lost a huge athletic figure and I I wasn't even a fan of Kobe Bryant, but I found something interesting in the world lately in that, that tragedy reminded us that this damn life is fragile. It is short and it's fragile. And if you are, not working for a dream or not doing what makes you happy you're surviving you are not living and do not ever waste a minute if you can help it in your life because just like that it can end and i just want to jump up and down and tell people how simple healing and life can be if we can get out of what's next and focus on what's in front of us. Well, I find and that the power of connection. Mm-hmm. Your book is a beautiful message, and I hope everybody buys it. And thank you so much for being on Near Death TV. Thanks.
helping me. And thanks for putting this together. I think it's a great resource for folks. You, you let me know. I'm happy to send some some very popular folks your way to, to continue this okay. process. I think it's we'll important. stay on the line. And this is it for Near Death TV today.